Welcome to another edition of the preseason preview series hosted by the CFF site, your number one resource for college fantasy football from the preseason to draft day all the way through the season. The CFF site's got you covered. My name's Joe DeSalvo, and as always, I'm welcome in, welcoming in my partner, Mike Bainbridge. Mike, we're on the, on the back half here of our West Coast swing. We started with the Mountain West. Today, we're going to get into the Pac-12 finish up our West Coast swing, and we're winding these down, actually, after today's show. I know you and I talked about it off air. We've only got Sunbelt, SEC, Independence to go after this, so we're winding down, and, you know, luckily for us, not a lot of change out there over the last couple of weeks, which is really going to keep these shows really relevant through most of the summer. At least that's the hope, right? Yeah, absolutely. I know we're, I mean, we're still two months out, but you know, the summer is flying by here. So once these are done, it's we'll, we'll do some best ball recap shows and, and you know, continue to update the rankings and projections as news comes in. But summer's flying right now. Yeah, you know, that, that's a key point. We just wrapped our third best ball draft. The results yet still to be published in the guide. So we're going to have those updates in the coming days for everyone. And you and I both know post July 4th is when college fantasy football drafts really start to heat up. So we're about to see an influx of people come on in and we want to make sure everything's updated. So even if you came in in late May and early last month or, you know, early June, earlier this month, make sure to check back periodically. We, we list the updates on that. We're getting everything updated as we go all the way up to the season. And then, of course, once we get the season, it's nonstop. Mike, you're going to be, you know, knee deep in the DFS stuff. We're both going to be tackling rankings, projections, and uh, it, it's go time once when kickoff starts, man. Can't wait. Let's do it now, man. Let's get into the Pac-12. And always, we try to find at least a nugget or two with some of the more insignificant college fantasy football programs, at least how we, you know, we feel about them for 2022. And, you know, let's just start at Colorado, Mike, where really there's not a lot to like in regards to college fantasy football this year. Mike Sanford comes in as offensive coordinator. You mentioned in your in your write up piece, you know, his offense has sort of been in decline over the years at the various programs where he's at. R.J. Sneed bounced in there, came over from Baylor. Uh, but Ramon Jefferson, which is one of the, well, which was one of their top signings coming in. Um, you know, from the FCS level, actually decommitted. And so, yeah, man, is there anything to like about that Colorado offense this year? No, not really. Uh, you know, trying to find some talking points with, with Colorado here. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a surprise just because remember in that COVID shortened season in Colorado, you know, first year, Carl Durrell, uh, Jared Broussard was obviously burst out onto the scene that year. And then last year, everything just kind of bottomed out. Yep. And you knew they were going to make some changes and they did, but like Mike Sanford's the best you can do. I, I mean, he, he was kind of a, a hot commodity, you know, five, six years ago, but then, you know, Western Kentucky, you know, the year, you know, their numbers dropped when he arrived. And then um, the same thing at, at Utah state and, and then most recently Minnesota. So right. I know he was kind of like a third, fourth, fifth, option for Carl Durrell at, at offensive coordinator. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens this yeah. year. It can't be much worse than last year. Um, as far as, you know, any fantasy relevant prospects, maybe Alex Fontenot in the backfield. Um, you know, we were kind of looking at Ramon Jefferson there uh, when he transferred in. Um, not a lot of proven depth behind Alex Fontenot. And, you know, under Sanford, you kind of just look back and, and it's, oh, it was a while ago back, even when he was at Boise state, but he did, he was the OC there when they had Jay Ajayi, uh had that uh, 300 carry season. Um, and then that COVID shortened season with, with Minnesota, when he was the offensive coordinator, they had Mo Ibrahim, as you recall, with 200 carries in seven games. So, um, you know, this is a coordinator that has ridden his running back one at times. Uh, Alex Fontenot is not capable of that, I don't think. Um, but, you know, maybe that's a name to keep an well, eye on. I, I, I didn't even, you know, we, we touched upon it in the Big Ten show. Uh, one of those names, Jarek Broussard, left for Michigan State, right? So when Jefferson backed out there as well, it really leaves the running back group thin. And like you said, right now going into it, Fontenot's probably the odds-on favorite to, to win that job. But you know, given what Colorado's got all around on offense right now, um, it's anybody's guess of, of what we're going to get. And, and for you and I, it's more of a stay away. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, offensive line, again, should be fine. I think they bring three starters back. They brought in a, a Alabama and an Iowa transfer to, to go along with those three starters. Um, so maybe the running game a- adds a little something here. But yeah, I, it's, as far as this year, it's a stay away from Colorado. Now let's go over to Cal, Mike, where the, you know, Cal lost a little, but they also still have a little in the stable, right? Musgrave is back in his second year as OC. They lose quarterback Chase Garbers. Christopher Brooks, the running back there, transferred over to BYU, but you still got Damian Moore there. You've got a couple of playmakers at receiver, Jeremiah Hunter, uh, Maven Anderson as well. Uh, if Cal can get some things figured out at quarterback a little bit, I think I think we can expect a little bit more from them than maybe Colorado right now. But any of those names I mentioned jumping off the page because right now in fantasy drafts, uh, Cal's nowhere to be seen in regards to the draft board. Yeah, not really. Um... Yeah, I mean, they lost pieces, but, you know, it's. I think it's time with Cal, and you would agree that, like, it's time to see some of these. They're, they're recruiting's fine, um, you know, getting those playmakers out west. So it's. I, I think it's time to see some of these these younger playmakers that they have kind of waiting in the wings. Um, taking a step back, I think we agreed when the, the hire was made that Bill Musgrave was kind of confusing. Like, I mean, this is a older NFL offensive coordinator yeah. bringing in, like, and, and, and I know you don't read them, but like some of those anonymous coaching quotes in the in like Athlon, for example, it's just funny reading their quotes because they were they were saying exactly that. It was like, oh, you know, they're bland, vanilla scheme, you know, kind of behind the times of you know uh, you know college football today. So I mean, it kind of fits. You know, they've been Cal's been bottom half of the Pac-12 in, in each year that Musgrave has been OC. Um, Marginal improvements last year, 24 points per game. Uh, I think they added around 66 yards per game to their totals from the year prior. So, um, you know, I'm kind of excited to see what Cal is this year. I think they got some young playmakers, you know, up and coming here. Jaden Ott is a a, a talented freshman running back that could compete with Damian Moore. Um, And then some sophomores in the wide receiver core who could make some noise this year. Yeah, I think definitely a program to keep our eyes on. You know, waiver wire is so important for college fantasy football. This would probably be one of those programs where we'll have one eye on as the season starts. We see how they go through their non-conference schedule and and who emerges as sort of the go-to players. Now, let's bounce over to the state of Arizona, Mike, where we've got two programs trending in opposite directions. We're going to start with the Sun Devils first, which, man, uh, it seems like things are just coming off at the wheels. They lose Rashad White, their best playmaker. Jaden Daniels transfers out of the program. They replace him with Emory Jones, who really couldn't find the broadside of a barn last year over at Florida. They bring in Zazavian Valade, the running back at Wyoming. And you or I, you and I both kind of scratch our heads sometimes wondering if he if it's more of an upgrade for Arizona State or was it more of Zazavian Valade reading the tea leaves of Titus Venn taking over as the lead back at Wyoming. Nonetheless, it does fill a void. You've got Daniel Nagata there, and by gosh, half the receiving core feels like it left through the transfer portal. What's going on over there with Herm and his boys? Well, those anonymous coaching uh, quotes that I referenced with Cal, they also have those for Arizona State, and they said this is the biggest dumpster fire in college football. I think I texted you that when all this stuff was going down with Herm Edwards. So, um, Pretty much a stay away for me with Arizona State. I think the one guy, you know, at price that kind of intrigues me is Emory Jones because you can get him in, you know, 30th round of a, of a draft. And, I mean, it's a guy that could run the football 130, 140 times. And as you know, if a quarterback's doing that in college fantasy, he's going to have some weeks where he's very relevant. So, um you know, I'm kind of staying away from the running backs. We might see a split there with Nada and uh, Valade. Uh, and like you said, can I, you know, tough to tough to name the the depth chart at Arizona State uh, at receiver beyond maybe Cam Johnson, the Vanderbilt transfer. So, and and does the depth chart even matter? Because you said Emory Jones can't hit the broad side of a barn. So, well, you know, the, here's the thing, um, and and here's where my interest at. Even though we could see a 50-50 split at running back, they're bringing in Glenn Thomas, the OC at UNLV, right? Mm-hmm. Who had Charles Williams, um, who who you know he grinded out Charles Williams, and UNLV wasn't great either. Now, 
a lot of the questions that you and I have handled so far is our projecting right now, Daniel Nagata ahead of the Zabian Valade, right? The, the thought is, and I think the consensus was from a lot of people out there that Valade would come in and just take over as the running back one. Nagata was a nice recruit when Arizona State got him. Uh, Chip Trianum transferred out to Ohio State to go play defense. They lose Rashad White. Uh, Nagata's pretty talented himself. Valade was great, uh, was really good, put up some solid numbers at Wyoming, but you and I are not expecting him to just walk in and take over as the starter day one. No, I think I, it's, there's no like confirmation here, right? Just right. kind of reading articles or reports, um, you know, just tea leaves kind of point to Nada being the guy for now. Uh, maybe once Valade gets more, you know, work in the summer, but I don't know. I just, I, I see a split here. I don't see a standout performer, um, but Glenn makes... Thomas, as you mentioned at UNLV has had uh, workhorses in the past. So yep. if one guy distinguishes himself, maybe you have some upside there. Well, to your point though, there wasn't much behind Williams at UNLV where you've got two guys now that could carry the ball. Right. And that's why we see in that. And then we're also getting into point of our discussion where you've got a program You've got a struggling program, and sometimes when you have a struggling program, you see them try to change up the parts here and there. And so that's the thinking of why you and I are not looking at this 1,200-yard rusher in the backfield this year at Arizona State. But, Mike, let's, let's flip over to Arizona. That seems to be trending more so in the opposite direction right now. They bring in Jaden DeLora, quarterback transfer from Washington State, right? They bring in Jacob Cowing, a thousand yard receiver transfer from UTEP to really upgrade and add some more depth to that receiving core running back still a little bit of a work in progress. I think right now you and I would probably agree. There might be a guy or two that, that are going to emerge as the cream of the crop. Um, but at least the Wildcats are trending in the right direction this year. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, it was noticeable with their recruiting class when you finish one and 11 and you got the 26 ring yep. uh, recruiting class. And and it, it's it's smart. I think you're definitely seeing teams like I, I would compare it to like a Missouri um, where you're you're not going to get the cream of the crop in terms of recruits just because, you know, you're Missouri in the SEC or you're Arizona in the Pac-12. But, you know, you're offering these guys you know, like immediate playing time, like a, a Jonah Coleman, who we got projected as running back one, or uh, uh, McMillan at, at wide receiver, um, and Kian Burnett, a guy that a guy that I like at tight end. So uh, I think you're going to see, especially after a one eleven season, you're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of youth this year with Arizona. Does that lead to immediate results? Maybe, right? Um, there's some intriguing parts. It can't be worse at quarterback. Um, you know, right. now that they have Jaden Delora in, in, in the projected starter. So, so we'll see. I think a lot of, uh, a lot of young pieces that, that has, you know, it's exciting. Top fantasy prospect going into the preseason for you, Delora or Cowing? Because I prefer Cowing at wide receiver over, over Delora right now. What about for yourself? Yeah, it's, I, I would, yeah, Cowing over Delora. I think it's interesting because, surprisingly you know they rotated what two three quarterbacks last year at Arizona and they averaged like 37 passing attempts per yeah. game which is which was it's, it's a high number for a team that really couldn't throw the ball that well last year so it's intriguing for Delora if he gets that kind of volume I would stick with Cowing I would not I don't think he's going to get a target share like Stanley Berryhill had last year. Remember he had like yeah. he was in double digit targets every single week. I just think they have better depth, right? With McMillan, um, Dorian Singer was a guy that emerged late. So I would have, I would rather have Cowling over Delora, but I think both could be valuable. I agree. Let's head up to Washington, Mike, where Kalen DeBoer takes over the program, comes over from Fresno State. Last year, I remember the Huskies offense was looking pretty stagnant at times. It was one of those offenses where you were mentioning with, you know, you know, with Cal, where it was just sort of that vanilla offense. That's what Washington looked at, looked like a bunch last year. They bring in the board. What's that? <laughs> Stagnant is being generous, I think. That's being Washington. nice about it, right? Yeah. But you look at the board, he brings in Michael Penix over from Indiana, Aaron Dumas in from New Mexico, Wayne Twalapapa at running back. They've tried to add some pieces to at least fit the mold of a little bit more of what they'd like to do, whether or not it's going to be enough 
in this first year still remains to be seen. They've got some playmakers, Jalen McMiller, right? At McMillan at receiver on Dunsey as well. So they've got some playmakers there. One of these programs, in my opinion, where Washington might be a little bit more of a stay away and watch. And we might see some players emerge. You know, you grab one of these, one or two of these players off the waiver wire as the season progresses. You know, is there going to be that running back that's maybe an equivalent to what Ronnie Rivers did for Fresno State? Will that be Aaron Dumas, where maybe you've got a six, 700 yard running back, three, 400 yard receiving running back? I don't know. I think it's going to take a little bit of time for DeBoer to put something together there, but at least he's, you know, you see him, there's an attempt by him bringing in some pieces right now. Yeah, I think they definitely are trying to uh, to shorten the, I don't even know how to put this, like the lag time between like, they're, they're by bringing in Michael Penix, who's got uh, experience under DeBoer, uh, back at Indiana. So I think they're trying to, to you know, to get that offense humming um, immediately. But, you know, you look back when he was at Eastern Michigan, I think that first year they were around 119th in pace, averaged like 15 points a game. But then it was just a steady increase because I think we would agree he's a hell of a play caller, right? Um, you know, look first year at, at Fresno, 27 points a game. That jumped to 34 points the next year. So it's definitely steady improvement, um, you know, year by year, but that there's always a transition with the, the, the debut season. Um, Michael Penix, I think, uh, you know, I'm not interested in the quarterbacks. I don't think you are either. No. Um, he's very turnover prone, injury prone. Um, so not really interested there. Running backs, I am not, I'm fading that for now. Um, you know, maybe somebody emerges at some point, kind of, you know, a la Ronnie Rivers, but they got eight, nine guys vying for a starting, you know, the starting job and nobody really stood out in the spring. So yeah. not a ton of interest there. If you're bringing in Wayne Talapapa to solve your problems, it's not a good situation. Um, I mean, strength is a receiver, right? Yep. Roma Dunsey, uh, Jalen McMillan, uh, Jalen Polk, uh, even tight end Devin Culp, I think that's a strong pass catching core that 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 whoever wins the starting quarterback job can work with so well talk about strong pass catching core mike let's let's go over to washington state where eric morris comes in as offensive coordinator he's joined by his quarterback from incarnate word cameron ward who seems to be very like a hot going on going off the board like a hot potato in these college fantasy football drafts uh, there's a lot to like about the Washington State offense. The one thing that I'll say before we just kind of rip into names a little bit is, uh, you know, I think some might be a little bit more worried to miss out on the next Western Kentucky 2.0. Um, and that seems to be the reason I think why, why Cameron Ward is kind of jumping off draft, draft boards right now, um, at least in my opinion. He's going a little too early for me. And I know they're going to throw the ball a ton. Um, I just don't know what he's going to be able to do with his legs, but he might be able to make up for that in volume. What, what's your take right now on Cameron Ward and his ADP right now? Uh, I think it's fine. Uh, you know, uh, I have him QB 15, QB 16. I think he's going off the board. Maybe fifth, sixth round is definitely where he's settled at right now. Uh, that's around, you know, between QB 8 and QB 12, I think. So I – I'm fine with with reaching, quote unquote, reaching for a quarterback in this system, right? With that kind of potential, um, you know, if it happens, I, I, you know, it, it's very similar to Bailey Zappi, just because, you know, offensive coordinator that he's worked with for for multiple years coming over, so there's no transition in terms of learning the system. Uh, he's got you know, a boatload of receivers that are very talented. So I, I you know, no shortage of weapons. Um, I think it's just the transition from incarnate word to the PAC 12, different from Bailey's Zappi, right? From, from FCS to, to conference USA, which right. there's a debate, even if there's a, the, you know, a difference in talent between, between those two, but obviously with the PAC 12, we only have one sample size of, of, um, Cameron Ward playing uh, FBS competition, which 
he fared well, 376 yards and four touchdowns against Texas State last year in an uh, upset victory. So, um, but again, Texas State debatable uh, if they're FBS level uh, competition. So, um, yeah, I'm fine with reaching up for Cameron Ward. I know you mentioned, you know, going a little too high for your taste, but again, you, you don't want to miss out necessarily on, on the potential of what Cameron Ward could be. Yeah, absolutely. And over at Mike, uh, at receiver Mike, Dejon Stribling, um, your top choice for wide receiver right now. He seems to be our top choice right now for that for that top spot. You've got Renard Bell, who returns after injury. You've got Donovan Ali back there as well. They even brought in the transfer. One of the transfers, I think, was the slot guy, and I forget his name. I'm drawing a blank on it, over from Incarnate Word. So there's going to be some nice options in that offense this year. Are we really going to see one guy just emerge as that Jareth Stearns type uh, from last year that's I think that's what a lot of people are going to ask you've got Cameron Ward they're going to throw it around a ton who should you know you and I have kind of putting our eyes on on stribbling right now that's who we're eyeing as sort of the top target right now yeah I think he's the best of the bunch um, but it, it, if you if you research it a little bit it's not similar to Western Kentucky where you know we talked about it, it's always the slot receiver in, right. in that system not the case. This is personnel dependent, could be the outside guy, could be a slot guy. So we feel Stribling is the most talented of the group. So he's our projected wide receiver one. Um, doing a little research though, you know, I'm worried about there being too much depth. Um, wide receiver one only accounts for 22% of the total target share on average in this, in this offense, which is not a high number. And then you drop down all the way to wide receiver four, they account for 12% of the target share um, in this offensive system in comparison to an Alabama. Alabama's wide receiver four only accounts for 7%. So the wide receiver four for, you know, this year for uh, Washington State is going to see a significant amount of targets. So um, I think too much depth is the concern uh, with this wide receiver group. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Let's go over to Stanford, Mike, where I actually think the Cardinal could be sneaky good in a bounce back year. Tanner McKee, McKee comes back. EJ Smith at running back, which he was featured pretty heavily in the spring and, and is sort of doing it all for them. They've got Elijah Higgins back at receiver, Ben Urasik at tight end, five offensive linemen back. I think this Stanford offense could be sneaky good this year. I really do. Depends on the offensive line. It, it, that's it. It depends on the offensive line. You get all five starters back, but they've been terrible the last few years. And that's a large reason as to why Stanford hasn't been as good as they were earlier on in, in David Shaw's tenure there. Um, because the pieces are there, right? You got a quarterback, Tanner McKee, being mocked by you know some outlets as a, a first round draft pick. It's not top 10. Um, so not really a fantasy relevant kind of option, but, um, you know, a talented guy, obviously EJ Smith. I tweeted this out today. Uh, last four years, David Shaw has ridden his running back one 48% of the time, uh, and compared to the other running back. So uh, it's a high volume, uh, share for, for David Shaw's running backs one. So, and that's obviously a good sign for EJ Smith. Uh, and then obviously they have a, a, a underrated, if you want to call them that, uh, pass catching group with Ben Urasek, top five tight end. And then, you know, healthy, uh, healthy group of Michael Wilson, Elijah Higgins, um, and the other guy name escaping me at this point, but is it Tremaine? Uh, say it again. Is it, is it Tremaine? Bryce and yeah. Tremaine? Bryce and Tremaine. There you go. Um, so, th I mean, that's, that's a really solid group of receivers there. So, as long as the offensive line kind of plays up to, you know, can they be a top 50, you know, offensive line? That's all you have to ask from, from Stanford. I, this is, a, I think, a, a really good offense potentially. Well, and to your point, given the workload that the RB1 for Stanford has, Stanford has gotten under Shaw, Shaw it's really making for, so for, uh, for, for some tremendous value for EJ Smith right now, because he's not going early. He's barely going in mid rounds. He's, I'd argue that he's going more mid to late rounds in drafts. I know I, I scooped him up in one or two of the first best ball drafts we had. I didn't get him this last draft, but he's been a guy that after the, the top 
40 or so have gone. He's certainly been on my radar to get as like my running back four, five, or six uh, down the line. Good value for Smith right now. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think he'll be a steal at, 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 at those prices, especially in PPR when they're, you know, Stanford kind of beat writers are mentioning they might use him like a la Christian McCaffrey uh, as a, as you know, in a dual pass catching role. So. Well, let's go over to the state of Oregon, Mike. Oregon State, we'll start with the Beavers, where they lose 1,300-yard rusher B.J. Baylor. Uh, all, all eyes, for the most part, will really, for me, for you, and I think for anybody else, is really, we, we're, it all kind of starts and stops right there at that running back spot, where you've got Deshaun Fenwick, who came over from South Carolina a year ago, played a little bit last year. Going into the spring, probably the odds on to, to at least come out of spring as the starter, but You've got the young kid there, Damian Martinez, right? Who you really like, seems to be making some waves. Uh, and just recently, as early as last week, you kind of told me, said, Joe, I, th- I think I'm ready to make the switch and put Martinez in that running back one spot. Yeah, I just don't want to miss there. You don't want to miss with a, a Jonathan Smith, you know, running back one, um, just proven production. I, it's one of the best offensive systems particularly for running backs, um, it, it, or maybe not best, but one of the more underrated ones in college football, in my opinion. One of the best uh, run-blocking offensive lines. They get three starters back. Um, I, you know, I watched the spring game. I wasn't, like, gushing over what I saw with Damian Martinez, um, but he just he fits what Jonathan Smith has just kind of had as his running back one in the past, you know. 225, uh, 220 pounds, just north-south runner. And if you just reading the articles, and, and I, I listened to a, a Oregon State podcast, they're just gushing over this kid, right? That he's just making waves in, in, in practice. So does Deshaun Fenwick start week one? Maybe. But, you know, I, I can see a situation where, it, you know, I'm a, I'll always reference it, a la Travion Henderson last year, where, you know, this, the freshman's probably likely to take over at some point, and, and you want to have him on your roster. Well, I'll bring up a point that we mentioned on some earlier shows, and that is usually in these type of situations, sometimes we know when there's the next man up, and we didn't know that for sure with Deshaun Fenwick. We didn't go into spring saying or come out of, 21, out of the 21 season saying, this guy's the next man up. He's going to be the running back one to have last year. And when you can't say that, it's sort of an it's sort of an open competition. So all all eyes are on Martinez right now. As you mentioned, Fenwick may get a go and may be run out of the gate first, just because of of seniority and just because he's been with the program. Uh, but but certainly all eyes on that because of Martinez, they're in no rush to name him the starter. He's a, he's a freshman, right? So you know they take their time with him. But you could be looking at a three year starter if he is the real deal deal here and. You know, quick pro and con on Oregon State, Mike. They returned four offensive linemen, you know, from a line that produced a 1,300 rusher last year. The question for me, and I think this is something that we really have to pay attention to as well, is I think Jack Coletto returns again, who ran some wildcat last year. He had 31 rush attempts in that offense. I think he's a linebacker, and he scored eight touchdowns. So he does have potential depending on who the who's the starter at running back to vulture some touchdowns away at the goal line. So there are some pros and cons to when that running back one eventually merges up at Oregon state. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't, I haven't even looked into Jack Collette all that much, but um, yeah, I, again, it's just, uh, it's a situation where I think you want to handcuff and, if I'm taking a chance on one, if you, if you don't have any transactions, you're doing one of our best balls. Yep. Um, you know, I'll take Damian Martinez probably over to Sean Fenwick at this point. And, um, you know, aside from that Oregon state, I, I don't have any interest in the passing game all about the running backs. Well, let's go to Oregon. Now we'll stay in state where one of the better programs in the country, um, have completely reshuffled the deck, right? Dan Lanning comes in, takes over, um, as head coach, brings in Kenny Dillingham from, from Florida State. Dillingham came with him. They go out to the portal. They get Bo Nix at quarterback. 
They grabbed Marquise Irving out from Minnesota to, to provide from de some depth, right? You got Byron Cardwell, who you and I are expecting to take over as the running back one, but you've got depth there. You've got Sean D Dollars. You've got the four for, uh, four star freshman coming in. Was it is it Jordan James? I think he's coming in, right? Travis Dye left, which really just kind of opened some things up. Um, I mean, we, we, you know, we could even mention Ty Thompson versus Bo Nix. Like, I feel like there's a lot of moving parts here at Oregon going into the season. And I think just to kind of go into the 2022 season, the player that may have the most fantasy appeal at this particular point may just be Byron Cardwell, because I think you and I are a little bit more sold that he might be running back one more than, than anything else. Yeah, I put... <sighs> It's tough. And that's not a like, confident. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's... No, it was, it was like, there, I remember when, when Marquise Irving transferred to Oregon, I was like, all right, I don't, you know, I loved what I saw from Byron Carwell last year. I loved it. And I'm like, I'm not scared off from, you know, a Minnesota backup and uh, a, a running back from Western Kentucky. Like that just does nothing for me. And like they did the, the bigger fact I thought was that Oregon needed bodies. They had no, but they really had one scholarship running back. I think during the spring, aside from Cardwell. So they needed right. depth in that backfield. Um, so I, I was still sold on Byron Cardwell, but then. Cause I, I think, didn't they, uh, 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 didn't they bring in Noah, Noah Whittington to so Western West Kentucky. Kentucky? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, they added bodies back there, but again, I, I, I was personally of the belief that Cardwell is is head and shoulders the better option between those that group of players. But again, just I, I read some kind of post spring articles from guys that are covering the team, and they weren't as sold as I was. And and these are guys that watch practice every day. I don't watch Oregon practice every day, so I'm gonna kind of lean on what they're telling me. And and they're saying, you know. Cardwell's the favorite, but you know, we might see a, a more a, a split backfield this year. So um, I think Oregon's going to be really productive running the football. Um, one of the best offensive lines in the Pac-12 this year. It's just a distribution of carries question that we we need to find answers to. Yep, absolutely, no doubt. Well, distribution of carries, uh, usually there's no concern when we're talking Utah, right? Where Tavian Thomas comes in. He's off of a, what, I think a 20 touchdown season, 1,100 yards, 21 touchdowns last year. And really, when it comes to fantasy, Mike, you kind of start and st stop with that Utah running back. You've got a couple of good, solid fantasy tight ends in, in Keithy and Kincaid, right? <laughs> Maybe Devon Vele at receiver, but let's be honest. I mean, it's all about Tavion Thomas, who is probably, you know, no doubt on top 10 preseason fantasy running back and a couple of tight ends. A am I missing out anywhere? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I wouldn't say it's a stone cold lock that Tavion Thomas is, is a top 10 fantasy back. I think you are going, I, I think, and you would agree with this too. We're going to see regression. I don't think we're going to see 20 touchdowns again um, from, from Tavion Thomas. I mean, that that's kind of an outlier uh, uh, for the system. And, you know, there's there, Utah kind of fits in that mold of you trust that they're going to have a, a solid to really good offensive line, but they're going through some, some turnover there along the offensive line. So um, I have not really drafted Tavion Thomas this year. Um, Again, turnover on the offensive line. Uh, I think you're going to see regression from 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 that that 20 touchdowns that he had last year because I think they really like the depth that they have um, at running back with freshman Jalen Glover. Um, you know, Micah Bernard's going to come in as a, a, a pass catching role. Um, so I, I, they've never had. You know, we talk about systems a lot, um, and Andy Lugway. You know, he. he absolutely one of the best offensive coordinators with with fantasy production at running back but never produced a top 10 running back before so I don't know I, I for me it's Tavion Thomas kind of fits in that that 10 to, to 15 range and I, I'm not drafting him uh six, than that. six 200 yard games 11 180 yard games that's I don't know how you can 
how he'll continue that pace. But let's be honest, Mike, 1,500 yards and 17 touchdowns, and I don't think anybody's really complaining. Um, but like you said, it's hard to expect back-to-back -back years of what Thomas did last year. But with the way that they feed the running back at Utah, the one thing you and I talk about all the time, give us a guy with a high workload every day of the week. We'll take that guy that gets 25-plus carries a game and roll the dice with him every week. Yeah, I, I, yeah I'm fine with that. I, I, would, I would at least pay attention again in the summer, in fall camp, if you continue to hear Jalen Glover's name pop up over and over again, I would start to get a little concerned about Tavion Thomas's potential workload. Well, with the one thing we know we could worry about Tavion Thomas is the one thing that we worried about early on last year. Remember, he couldn't hold on to the ball. So you, you have to do that in Utah's offense. It's all about ball control, play defense. That would be the only bugaboo that comes back to fight uh, to bite Tavion Thomas and gives Glover that opening that maybe, but like you said, it's a great name to put on the radar because if not next year, Mike, this, we, I mean, if not this year, next year, this could be, the, that could be the guy that takes over. And just an example where we were talking about Oregon state, we really didn't get that feel with Deshaun Fenwick. We could get it with Glover, right. Going in with Utah. So keep an eye definitely on that name. Now, another offense that has potential to ride its running back as well. Let's go over to Chip Kelly's offense, UCLA, where, Dorian Thompson Robinson returns. Zach Charbonnet returns at running back. There was a lot of, uh, I know I read a lot in the earlier in the spring where Charbonnet really dedicated himself to, to get himself even in more shape to carry a workload this year. I'm expecting a big year from him. He had 1,100 yards, 13 touchdowns. I think he could go higher than that this year. They lost Kyle Phillips at receiver, like, which was sort of DTR safety blanket, him and Greg Dolchik. They lost both of those guys. Maybe a replacement could be Jake Bobo from Duke. There are some other options on that UCLA offense. And then Michael Aziki, who I would think is going to be some sort of a fantasy factor for us as a fantasy tight end this year. Uh, that's sort of the names that are being drafted this year. Maybe not so much Bobo, but Aziki, Charbonnet, DTR, probably the top three value guys on the UCLA roster right now. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, a lot of pieces that, that a lot of draftable pieces here. Um, Start with DTR. I was surprised um, that just the consistency that he's shown. And I, I think he fits in the mold of like huh, another senior quarterback. You know, we kind of, he's been through the wars. We, we know what to expect. Probably not a lot of upside from what he's done, which is, which is fine. That's a top 15 quarterback right there. So the consistency that he showed, I think he scored 20 points in 11 of the 12 games he played last year. So um, you know, not a guy like Cameron Ward, with just the high ceiling, but I think it can, from a consistency standpoint, I love DTR. Um, Charbonnet, I wasn't there immediately, but I, I, I you know, I'm kind of sold now. Just, I mean, he had 200 carries and he was splitting with, with Britton Brown for a lot right. of the year. And they just, I don't think they're sold on who's going to be that backup to, to Charbonnet this year. So, um, I think, you want guaranteed volume, but you made uh, you made a really good lock for two fifty. You made a really good point when talking about DTR. You referenced this on a couple of shows earlier um, about how you know the guy that's been there, tried and true. Uh, I think we mentioned this when we were talking about the Fresno State offense, right? When we were doing Mountain West, where Cropper returns, Hayner comes back. All of a sudden, now you've got DTR back now for another yet another year, and he's just sort of been there. But to your point been a model of consistency and in two quarterback leagues it's kind of hard to beat him as your quarterback too isn't it I mean that would be one a guy that would be your perfect QB2 uh you know slides right into that spot consistency may not have the upside of 40 45 plus point performances on a week-to-week -week basis but like you mentioned man those 25 plus on a consistent basis 30 that's what you're looking for yeah, and we don't have the two bye weeks like he had last year. So, um, yeah, I, I'm fine. DTR, even if he's your, if, even if you punt quarterback a little bit and and grab him eighth, yep. ninth round where he's typically going. I mean, incredible value. He's a QB one as well. So, you know, a little worried about the pass catching options because he loses, you know, his top two from last year. Um, Bobo, I mean, he was a target hog at one point last year with Duke. So. Um, you know, not sure he's going to exactly replicate Kyle Phillips's production, but I think he's a solid receiver. 
Um, Ezekiel's interesting for me because, you know, you talk about tried and true offensive systems. Like there's arguably no better system for tight ends than, than Chip Kelly's. Um, so, I mean, it's a guy that, you know, four-star receiver coming out of college and obviously hasn't had the production, but anytime you get a receiver converted tight end and he solidified his spot, uh, starting spot in the spring, which is, which is promising, right? You, you don't want to be kind of wavering like, oh, maybe he'll start, um, you know, they got some other tight ends, but I think beat writers mentioned that he's locked down that starting job, which is, which is promising. Yep. Now let's finish up with USC, Mike, where Lincoln Riley comes over, West Coast guy now, brings over Caleb Williams, the quarterback from OU. You have him as your top quarterback this year, but it, it doesn't start and stop right there. Obviously, they lose Drake London at receiver. No love lost there, though, because they bring in the Blitnikoff Award winner, J Jordan Addison from Pitt. Got Mario Williams that came over from Oklahoma. There's still receivers left over from last year's roster. Uh, so there's a ton of talent at receiver. They add Travis Dye at running back, bring him in, in from Oregon. Ton of storylines right here, particularly on college, you know, for college fantasy football. If, if I was to say that there was one, and we could each, you know, we could, we could spend a few minutes on here. Um, you know, you look at the workload Dye had last year at Oregon. I think so far up until this point, a lot of folks, a lot of guys are a little surprised at how low we have Dye ranked. But this isn't die in an Oregon offense. This is die in an Oakland. In, I'm sorry, in a USC offense, right? And so that factored into our decision when it came to running back rankings, and particularly ranking die. Yeah, he's kind of tough, and it, it, it's tough because um, just production's kind of sporadic with with running backs in, in uh, for for Oklahoma, for Lincoln Riley Lincoln when he was at Oklahoma. Um, you know, there's not, a, you don't see a consistent 200 carry guy. You don't see a consistent, you know, double digit rushing touchdown guy. Um, you know, it's kind of sporadic. You know, he had Joe Mixon one year who had 30 receptions and then you get 10 receptions from, from like a Kennedy Brooks. So tough to project a little bit with Travis Dye um, this year, just kind of what workload he's going to get. I'm trending upwards a little bit with him just because, Austin Jones doesn't threaten me one bit. I don't even think he might be RB2. I think that might be Darwin Barlow. So, um, you know, I think Travis Dye is clear cut running back one here. And, um, you know, I think you would agree that, you know, prior to last year, we thought Travis Dye is, uh, you know, kind of a third down, you know, receiving type back, but 16 rushing touchdowns from a guy at 190 pounds is is impressive. So we know we can handle the workload. So um, I'm kind of trending upwards with, with Travis Dye this year. How about yourself? Yeah, I think, I, 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 I think we're trending up as well. The, the problem is, and like you mentioned, sometimes Riley has, has had the, you know, he, he's shown that he can rotate some guys through there. Right. And I think, you know, you've got, you know, one publication uh, such as rivals, has Relique Brown come in as the top running, one of the top running back recruits in the nation. And he's one of the top for 24 seven as well. You wonder if one of the, you know, somebody like him figures into some early play in time as well. Right. And so, like you mentioned, it's really hard for us to just imagine a running back right now. That's going to, you know, maybe, maybe get close to 200 touches between receptions and, and carries. I could see that happening, but you've got some other factors in play here. You've got some other running backs on the roster like Barlow, like Brown coming in, but you've also got Caleb Williams and Mike, you've got him as your quarterback one, which means he's going to vulture a lot of those scores around the goal line as well, or at least that's the projection right now, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's an interesting case because look, there's nobody in college football, in my opinion, that produces more top five, you know, top three quarterbacks um, from a fantasy perspective than Lincoln Riley. Right. So yeah. um, I, I, that's why I like Caleb Williams as my QB one. Um, I just think it's situation sets up perfectly where you have no shortage of options. Like I, he wouldn't be my quarterback one. I don't think if Jordan Addison wasn't there, but you have arguably the best wide receiver in college football. He was last year. So uh, you have Jordan Addison. And I think the potential for shootouts is just, 
you know, out of this world with with how potentially bad they're they're well deep. there's there's deep no stuff. debating the system and really the only thing that's making anyone balk from Caleb Williams is just the two-year stint that Spencer Rattler had there because before we went the first year of Spencer Rattler I know I had Rattler projected high for that simple reason that Riley the hit the I mean the the history of the numbers of his QB1 are just ridiculous yeah, absolutely. I, I, I just, I, I, I like the situation here where you got a bona fide wide receiver one, you got a terrible defense. So game script's going to set up well for, for your offense, you know, Pac-12 schedule is not going to be overbearing. Um, and, and, and again, just, just surrounding Caleb Williams with the system that he knows, you know, there's warning signs, right? I mean, he, he put up a stinker at Kansas last year. Right. And, and, the, you know, and, and just kind of how that Oklahoma offense operated as, as, as a whole last year. But I just, I, I, I it's a gut feel that I, I see a lot of 40 point games uh, in the PAC 12 this year with USC. Well, I don't think, you know, Lincoln Riley and top five fantasy quarterbacks are really synonymous. Like I mentioned, the, the Spencer Rattler was sort of the, the anomaly of, of his long list that he's had. So whether you've got Caleb Williams at quarterback one or quarterback five, um, you know, it doesn't really matter. Top five quarterback under Lincoln Riley is going to produce some numbers and it's going to be a hit for you, Mike. So look, that's going to do it for the PAC 12. We're finished our West coast swing. We're almost done, man. We've got what three shows left independent sunbelt sec. We're coming up to the 4th of July draft season's about to get hot and heavy. We're going to put a bow on this show right now. And, you know, we'll be recording the next few shows over the, over the coming days. And for all you guys out there that are, that are watching, listening, Uh, Like I said, check back periodically. Mike and I will be updating some stuff over the coming months, whether it's rankings, whether it's getting some ADP data in there, refreshing that or getting the latest Best Buy results. We're actually putting the links for these shows at the end of the preseason fantasy guide, the digital links as well for you guys accessing it online. So that's going to do it, Mike, for the preseason preview series, Pack 12 My name's Joe DeSalvo with the CFF site. For Mike Bainbridge, we'll see you guys at the next show when we talk independence and then get into the Sun Belt.